Okay guys, so in order to go over those inductor questions, we need to primarily go over this equation right here. This is our go-to equation for any of these coils. XL is equal to 2 times pi times frequency times L. Now, I'm putting it as 2 pi FL, right? But it's 2 times pi times frequency times L. Okay, for those guys, we can organize that into like an Ohm's Law chart. So we can put the XL on the top here. And then we're putting 2 pi. Then we've got frequency. And then the other thing that's going to affect our XL is the L value. Okay, so you can do that. And then you can cover up, like uh, if you're looking for the L, you can cover up the L. And obviously it's XL divided by 2 times pi times F. Okay, so for this guy... There are a number of different terms that we've got to look at. So XL is our inductive reactance. So it can't be called resistance because reactance has to do with magnetic fields. It's the cannery MF. So another name for this guy is going to be back voltage or cannery MF. So it resists current, right? The units for this guy are in ohms, but it's primarily a back voltage, so but even though it's a back voltage, they still give it uh, an ohmic value for the units. Okay, so it's inductive reactance rather than inductive resistance because it's talking about how the magnetic field is creating a counter voltage to limit our current flow. It's not the physical resistance of the wire. Okay, what's the next thing? 2 pi. Well, we're dealing with AC and XL is primarily seen in AC circuits. Uh, so the 2 pi is the 360 degrees of rotation of the generator. There we go. Okay, so, and we've seen that on previous classes where I've drawn the 360 degrees of rotation, and that provides us with that sine wave output, right? Every point here provides us with an increase in voltage, then we get to our peak voltage there, and then all of a sudden we've got the voltage decreasing. Once it gets to 180, then it starts pushing current in the opposite direction. So 360 degrees of rotation gives us 360 electrical degrees on our sine wave. Okay, next thing we've got is the frequency. So the frequency is the number of sine waves that go through every second. The units for that are in hertz, and hertz are the number of cycles per second. So remember, a cycle is a full sine wave from start to finish. Good lord, can't write today. Beautiful. Okay, so if you've got more sine waves going through, that means that the magnetic field is changing at a higher rate, and the rate of change of the magnetic field is going to provide us with that back voltage as well, right? The faster the magnetic field moves across the stationary conductor, the more voltage is induced. It's opposite of the source, right? So Faraday's law says that it's an induced voltage, but his buddy Len says, yeah, it's an induced voltage, but it's in the opposite direction of the source. So that's what's creating that inductive reactance. Okay, the next thing that comes in is the L value. Okay, the name for the L is inductance. Okay, the units for that are in Henry's. So I believe Henry was another dude without a cell phone with lots of time on his hands to look at different equations and I think you found that if you pump an amp per second through a coil, you get one volt of counter EMF. So the inductance is just primarily the physical properties of the coil. So we'll put that down here. So the things that determine how much counter EMF you're going to get when you've got that certain amount of frequency going through it. So physical properties of the coil, we're going to primarily talk about the number of turns. 
because that is the main thing that's going to control how much counter voltage is developed, right? On a generator, if you want more voltage produced, you got to have more conductors, right? So we'll primarily talk about number of turns. Uh, there's other things like type of core, right? Type of conductor, and all kinds of other things that you can look at in the physical makeup of the coil. But essentially, we're going to look at this guy with the number of turns for the inductance. Okay, so this whole thing that we're going to go through in the next video on all the inductive reactance equations, uh, I'm putting them in series and parallel, they're all primarily to look at this equation right here. XL is equal to 2 times pi times frequency times L. And we've been talking about this equation all the way since uh, the first week. So I've mentioned it at least 20 times now. So uh, you've got it in the deep recesses in your mind, this next uh, thing where we're going to go through it with the questions is just to pull it out of the deep recesses, deep recesses of your mind and have it there for the test. Okay, you can forget it two weeks after you leave from school. But it does provide you with a number of answers when you're out in the field and you're troubleshooting as well. Because everything that we hook up is a coil, so everything goes off of this equation. Okay, the other equation that we may need to use uh, would be this guy here. Where are we going to put that? We'll put that right here that the L value, the inductance value, can also be found if we have, what, XL divided by 2 times pi times the frequency. Okay, most of the things that we're hooking up are at 60 hertz. So at 60 hertz, if you punch that into your calculator, let me bring up the calculator so we can take a look. Okay, so what have we got? We need to have uh, 2 times pi. Where's my pi there? It's hidden right here. Second function. And this button right here, 2 times pi times 60 is going to give me 376.99. So from now on, we're just going to say that it's 377, right? So we don't have to continuously punch in 2 times pi times 60. Okay, so 2 times pi times 60 hertz, as long as it's 60 hertz, is going to be 377. Okay, so we'll just make a note there that at 60 hertz, 2 times pi times 60 is going to give us roughly 377 from now on. Excellent. Okay, so in with this equation here, we can see that um, if we just type in xl equals 2 pi fl again, we can see that they are directly proportional between uh, the frequency and the xl. That makes sense. If we have a higher rate of frequency, right? So if we have 60 hertz versus 1,000 hertz, then here at 1,000 hertz, the sine wave is changing at a high rate of speed. And as that cuts across our conductors, it induces the voltage, and this is the voltage, the inductive reactance or the cannery EMF, right? So, And they are directly proportional. So if I double the frequency, then I'm going to double the XL value there. Okay, that holds true if we reduce those guys, right? So if we reduce the frequency, that's going to reduce our XL, right? So again, we've got this frequency, and then we go to a lower frequency, and so we have less cutting action across the conductors and less induced voltage, and it's a directly proportional, right? As soon as you change one thing on this side, then this side of the equation changes by the, by the same amount, right? It's just ratios. Okay, we can do the same thing, like we can also look at the number of turns. So as we increase the number of turns, then we're also going to increase the cannery math. If we decrease the number of turns, then we're going to decrease the cannery math as well. Right? But most of the time, uh, we can't physically rewire the thing. The only thing that we're able to change in this equation would be the frequency. Right? The 2 pi is always the same with that 360 degrees of rotation. So... We talked about uh, drives and that a variable frequency drive is going to change the frequency in order to get the motor to go faster or slower. And in order for the motor to go faster, then the frequency goes up, right? So we said that in order to go faster, then the frequency in the drive is going to go up. If the frequency goes up, we can see that the XL goes up by the same amount. And if we look at Ohm's law, where we've got a constant voltage, um, and we've got the XL value, which goes right here for our resistance, right? If that guy goes up, then the current 
is going to go down. And that sucks if we're trying to control the, the speed of a motor. And by making the motor go faster, yeah, we got to go faster, but then all of a sudden we lose current. And as we lose current, we lose torque, right? Because the torque is based off of the magnetic fields. So the drives are also going to increase the voltage. So if we were looking at uh, a drive, then we would graph this guy out and we would have the voltage and the frequency. Easy now. The frequency. And as we increase the, the frequency, we also have to increase the voltage as well. And then, because we know with the drive, when the motor is just idling, we still get full torque. So the, what the beauty of a drive is, is that you can get full control of the speed of the motor and you get full torque even when the motor is just idling all the way up to full speed, right? So the, the torque would be the slope here. And for us, the slope of that line is staying constant. So from zero speed all the way up to full speed, that torque is basically staying the same. And then you guys asked in class, well, how does the, how does the drive change the voltage? And then I was stumped. I couldn't find it in the deep recesses of my mind. Saturation had uh, set in. So we'll just quickly go over that. In a drive, you've got AC that goes in. It has the rectifier, right? So here we've got three phase going in, six diodes to rectify it. There's a smoothing coil, right? Just to deal with any spikes that go through. Then we've got the smoothing capacitor there. That gives us our DC bus. And essentially we always have the same voltage available from that DC bus. And these guys, the transistors are going to turn on and they're going to fire on the DC to the motor. And when we get the DC going to the motor, where's a decent uh, diagram? Not that one. What happened there? This guy right here, right? So this is our DC going to the motor in that the voltage turns on and then turns off and then the transistor turns on and then turns off for a hot longer time then again turns on for a longer time and we send this these dc square waves to the coils but the coils have that eli right where the voltage leads and the current lags so the voltage leads the current lags by a little bit and the the actual coil of the motor smooths this out and instead of getting a sine wave for the current we end up getting this nice smooth sign sorry instead of getting a square wave for the current we get this nice smooth sine wave for our current and then you guys said well how does it change the the voltage and again i was stumped and i just found a decent uh, diagram right here so you can see here that um, you can change the frequency and by changing the frequency um, you can change the output sine wave to the actual motor. And by changing the output sine wave to the motor, you can change the speed at which that magnetic field spins. So the way that they change the voltage output is that you can see here that that DC bus is basically always the same off of this point here where this capacitor is, right? You always have the same voltage. So it, the voltage changes with the amount of time that the transistors are actually on for. So if you want to have a higher voltage output, with the same frequency, you can see here that the same frequency output is happening, but the timing that the actual square waves are on for with this pulse width modulation, the, this timing is increased. And so you get more, vo more voltage output and you can see the two sine waves compared in that the frequency is identical between the two of them, but you can see that this is a larger voltage output because the transitions have essentially turned on for longer for each of the pulses. So sorry for being stumped there in class, uh, but rather to, I'd rather give you guys the be the better answer rather than trying to make something up. Okay, so what else do we need to go over? We need to go over the series connections and the parallel connections of the coils. So let's see what ink do I have here. I got some black. Okay, so we've got uh, series connections of the coils, and then we've got parallel connections. I put let's put them down here. So we're just going to essentially say that these guys are all in phase. So we're not going to have to deal with Pythagoras or anything like that. So we'll just put three coils in series here and we'll label them L1, L2, and L3. 
And for these guys, when you look at them, you have to say, you know, am I making a larger coil or am I making a smaller coil? Well, in this case, going from one side to the other, we are increasing the number of turns, right? So from here to here, we're making a larger coil. We're increasing the number of turns. And on this equation here, when this value goes up, and L, we said, was the physical properties of the coil, and essentially that's one of the things is the number of turns. So if that goes up, then the XL value is going to go up as well. So for each of these circuits, when they're in series or when they're in parallel, you have two choices. You either add up the values or you do the reciprocal equation. In this case, well, it looks like the total inductance is going to be larger, right? So we're just going to add them up. The first coil plus the number of turns on the second coil plus the number of turns on the third coil. So hopefully you can see how by simplifying the inductance down to the number of turns, it helps when we get to these equations over here. Number of turns here, plus number of turns here, plus number of turns here, obviously gives us the total number of turns or the total inductance for the circuit. Now, if that value goes up, then the XL is directly proportional. So the XL should have the exact same equation. So our XL total should be the same as if we had resistors in series. If we had three resistors in series, we would just add up each of those resistance values to give us our total resistance. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say XL1 plus XL2 plus XL3 is going to give us our total inductive reactance for a series circuit where we have coils connected in series. Okay, so obviously for the parallel, when we draw those guys out, we can see that there are multiple paths for current to flow. There's one path there. We'll throw in three coils again. There's another path, and then we've got three paths here for the current to flow. So again, we've got L1, L2, and L3. If you're wondering where the L came from, remember that's a shout out to our buddy Lens. So with this guy in parallel, well, we've already done the addition of them, right? If we had three resistors in parallel, then we would most likely use the reciprocal equation. Well, why don't we do that again? Because these guys are all creating a resistance. It's not an actual resistance. It's called an inductive reactance, but it should follow the same rules as resistors. So it doesn't matter if it's coils or resistors or capacitors. In series, we're going to add up the resistance values. In parallel, we're going to do the reciprocal equation. So our total XL here is going to be equal to 1 over 1 over XL1 plus throw the toit over here, 1 over XL2 plus 1 over XL3. Okay, same equations we had if they were all resistors. Now, that value there for the XL is directly proportional to the L value, so our total inductance, even though we have a number of different coils there, that inductance value is actually going to go down. So, whoa, what's happening there? This equation here is going to be 1 over L1 plus 1 over L2 plus 1 over L3. They are directly proportional in that whatever happens to this guy happens to this guy. So we'll have the exact same equation for the parallel connections of the coils. All right, guys, we'll finish off there. Uh, keep going on the playlist. The next one covers all of our uh, inductive reactance questions and review questions on series and parallel connections of the coils as well. All right, guys, we'll see you in the next video.